اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم اللہم صلی علی محمد و علی محمد دیو رسپیکٹڈ شیخ اسامہ برادرز اینڈ سسٹرز اینڈ اٹینڈنس اینڈ واچنگ ایٹ ہوم السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ Thank you very much for joining us tonight for our Saturday night program. Uh, inshallah, to start the program off, we'll, uh, please welcome Brother Ali Baydoun with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <laughs> صلوا على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبح اسم ربك الأعلى الذي خلق فسوى والذي قدر فهدى والذي أخرج المرعى والذي أخرج المرعى فجعله غثاء سنقرئك فلا تنسى سنقرئك فلا تنسى إلا ما شاء فذكر إن نفعت الذكرى سيذكر من يخشى ويتجنبها الأشقى سيذكر من ويتجنبها الأشقى الذي يصلى النار الكبرى ثم قد أفلح من تزكى قد أفلح من تزكى 
قد أفلح من تزكى وذكر اسم ربه فصلى بل تؤثرون الحياة بل تؤثرون الحياة الدنيا والآخرة خير وأبقى صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد أحسن برضو علي فيز صلى الله صلوات السلام عليكم once again brothers and sisters just a couple of announcements before we welcome Samahat al Sheikh. Um, firstly, just um, face masks are required at all times within the building. Um, and we do ask that you please practice safe social distancing as uh, you guys can all observe the chairs are spaced out uh, generously and try not to congregate uh, as much as possible uh, just to avoid uh, any issues that might uh, come about. Uh, we do ask that we limit movement during and after the program as well um, due to trying to limit some of these um, uh, due to some of these restrictions the bathrooms uh, are open they are across the gym floor if you want to if, if you need to use the bathroom please see one of the brothers or sisters in the back and they can direct you to the, um, the spot inshallah um, without any further ado, please help me welcome Samahat al-Sheikh Osama with three loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين روحي وارواح العالمين له الفداء رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي so dear brothers and sisters first of all welcome back to the Hadi Institute and our in person programs now what we're doing the topic or the title of the lecture series is called the good life what we're going to be doing inshallah is in person programs and i welcome or ask brothers and sisters when you can to try wherever you are to, the, to attend those majalis which are in person. It's something that we kind of have to retrain ourselves to do because we've gotten used to the idea of learning our religion and showing our commitment to the Ahlul Bayt remotely. But now that alhamdulillah there is a way for us to do it in person safely away from one another then I encourage brothers and sisters to try and do that. Your brothers and sisters here at the Hadi Institute are ready to welcome you and to try and keep the program inshallah safe. Now, what we want to do is something a little bit different. 
um, for these regular programs. So it's different for when we have majalis series, but for regular programs where we're reminding ourselves of akhlaq and these kind of things, what we'd like to do is to cover a little bit of the ahkam. We want to remind ourselves a little bit about the ahkam. So we'll take maybe five minutes in the beginning, just reminders of, these, of the ahkam, the importance of the ahkam, some of the rulings, and hopefully we'll be able to apply that to ourselves. So we're just going to start from the beginning of the risala. Many nights I'll literally just be reading from the piece of paper. We're going to start by the idea of taqlid. Now taqlid, brothers and sisters, all of us actually are performing taqlid in many areas of our lives right now, currently. The reason is that we intellectually have come to this conclusion that we're not specialists in every field of life. So we refer to experts in those areas where we are not experts. The expert in Islam, when it comes to the ahkam and the rulings, is called the mujtahid, the faqih. And we, as non-experts who are referring to this person and their area of expertise, are referred to as muqallid, or plural, muqallidin. We're muqallidin following our mujtahid. In Islam, brother, there's a ruling now. It is wajib for us, this is now on us, on our necks, to find out every ruling in Islam that applies to us. It's also a responsibility to teach, but it's our responsibility as mukallafin. If there's a ruling, something that I'm doing, I have to personally have to go over, I write my marja's office, I connect with them, I talk to my local scholar, and find out what the ruling is. Because otherwise, I'll be considered a sin. In other words, in Islam, ignorance is not an excuse. We have to learn. Because of this, and it's also self-evident that we're not going to all be experts in the religion, it's natural that we do this process of taqlid. As non-experts, we refer to the mujtahid. There's a beautiful verse of the Holy Quran, um, Surah 9, verse number 122, where Allah says this, wa ma kana it's not possible for all of the believers to go, all of the believers to set out to learn. He says, فَلَوْلَا نَفَرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِنْهُمْ طَائِفَةٍ So why not from every group, you have a group, a ta'ifa, who go to learn. Brothers and sisters who go overseas to learn the religion. Why? لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ that these people gain that deep understanding of the religion. Then after that, the responsibility of these people is to warn the rest of us, to deliver the ahkam that they've learned to us. So we see very beautifully addressed in the Quran, our responsibility and also the responsibility of some in our community, readying some of the believers in our community to go overseas and to make that journey. Now what happens is our Fuqaha get rulings from four sources. Of course, the first is the Book of Allah, the Quran. The second are the Ahadith. And what happens is a Faqih won't go over and just take one Hadith or one eye of Quran. They have to look at all of the relevant evidence and then put the Fatawa together. They have two other sources. One of them is called the Ijma. Ijma, brothers and sisters, is consensus. What happens is, if the previous fuqaha, the ones who were there at the time, very close to when our imam went into ghaybah, they all come to a conclusion and say such and such is wajib to do. Although we don't have access to that hadith, we know that ijma, that consensus, every faqih comes to this conclusion that it's wajib to do such and such. We realize that there must have been a, fa- uh, a hadith that we missed and we can refer to that ijma. There are details that are explained later. The other, of course, is aql. The intellect arrives at some rulings that we're able to get rulings from. For instance, if something is wajib for us, the preliminary of that wajib act is also wajib. That's a ruling that the intellect comes to. And lastly, this was something not only establishes an intellectual argument that you and I can present to anyone. Any rational person can say, well, this makes sense. We have to be making taqlid. We're already currently doing that. It's also something that the Ahlul Bayt did during the time when the Imam was present. This is also important for us. 
When the Imam was present, when you could go to the Imam, when you could meet and talk with Imam Sadiq, at that time, was there taqlid? Absolutely. We have many a hadith about this. I want to share one where a man is speaking to the eighth Imam. Today, inshallah, we're going to be commemorating three important events. One of them, the shahada of the eighth Imam. The Imam explains to Imam Rida, he says that I live far away from you. I'm not able to come to benefit at all times. Who should I take the principles of the religion from? Who do I learn deen from? And the Imam explained, Min Zakari ibn Adam al-Qummi. You go to, you do taqlid of Zakariya. This individual who is ma'mun ala deen wa dunya. Someone who you can trust when it comes to deen and dunya. So this process was something which was established even at that time. Now, on to our topic for tonight. But first, inshallah, salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So our first good life session coincides with three very important events in the Islamic calendar. Three sad occasions that literally changed the history of Islam. We would be commemorating both the wafat of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then also we have the shahada of Imam Hassan but then also for today, for the last day of Safar, then also we have the Shahada of Imam al Ridha. So, three very, very important events. Each one of these events represents an irreparable loss to Islam. On one side, the believers were very concerned, inshallah, I'll mention a little bit about that. On the other side, this was a huge victory for the Tawagi. They would rejoice. When the Imam would go down, when there's a transfer of power, the Tawagheet would rejoice. For instance, it's mentioned that when Imam Hassan alayhi salam, remember how he finally achieved martyrdom and went to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his wife poisoned him. But it was the Tawagheet who were directing them. They told his wife, they promised Muawiyah. When the news reached Muawiyah that finally it's worked and the Imam who was that threat, who was the person who was stopping, nullifying the actions of Muawiyah was dead. This is what is mentioned in the books of history. Lama balagha Muawiyah mawtul Hassan. When the death of Imam Hassan, the news of the death of Imam Hassan reached Muawiyah sajada. He went into a state of sajda. Wa sajada man hawlah. All of those who were around Muawiyah, they also went into a state of sajda. That, Alhamdulillah, the enemy, that person who is the, the face of the resistance has passed. وَكَبَّرَ وَكَبَّرُوا مَا Not only that, he did takbir. And they all did takbir. You can see they were celebrating. On the other side, for the believers, there's two reasons that I want to mention, two things that I, lessons for us that I want to mention. But, it was the opposite was true. Whether it's Imam Hassan, whether it's Imam Rada, whether it's Rasulullah, such a state of shock, such a, such a state of confusion, desperation of those who were concerned about the religion, they had some things that they were really worried about. For the believers, they had lost their father, they had lost their leader, their guide. The person who was everything for them, Rasulullah. The person who was the connection between them and the heavens. He had died. It's natural that the people losing this kind of a leader, there will be a huge emotional response. A man tells us, we have eyewitness accounts of what happened when our prophet died. The man says, I went to Medina, and he says, remember Medina at that time was a small city. He says this, the people were wailing. He says it was like Hajj. Imagine all those people would be there for Hajj. The noise, he says that Medina was like that. He says, I asked what happened. They said that the Prophet had passed. So that emotional reaction was there. The people knew they had lost this leader. For those who were concerned about the course of the religion, there were two things that they were very afraid of. The thing that they're very afraid of 
is the issue of wilaya and the transfer of power. For those who were concerned about the religion, what happened was the prophet or the imams after him, when he was there, his wilaya was established. Remember, according to us, wilaya is the core of the religion. We have so many ahadith from Ahlul Bayt that Islam was built on five things. And the most important of them is wilaya, that authority. If that's there, everything else is safe. The wilaya of the Ahlul Bayt was established during the time of Rasulullah, for instance. Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein. But when he died, there's going to be a transfer of power. There will be a new imam. For the previous wali, he's established, the people know him, his wilaya is there, they trust him, they follow him. The enemy has plots, the enemy always has plots. But what would happen would be that one speech of Rasulullah, one speech of Imam al-Ridha, one speech of Imam al-Hasan could gather the masses. People could recognize the plot. The danger and the sensitivity was always after the death of the wali. What's going to happen next? The enemies, they're rejoicing, ready to attack Islam. The believers are concerned. I want to see if I can share this in a beautiful story. Inshallah, brothers and sisters aren't scared of jinn stories. And if you are scared, then I'm here. So no reason for us to panic. Beautiful, beautiful story about the time of our prophet. Let's remember that point, though, the transfer of power. What happens is, <clears throat> they say this. Our prophet was sitting... And a man came into the presence of Rasulullah, and it was as if as he was as tall as a date tree. SubhanAllah, this huge, tall guy came. The Prophet of Allah asked him, who are you? The man introduces himself. I'm Ham bin Heem bin Laqis bin Iblis. Rasulullah says, so you're the great grandson of shaitan? He says that, he starts introducing, remember the point, why is it Rasulullah, why this time, why in this way? He says that, I was there when Qabil killed Habil, in the time of battle. I was there, he says, I was a young boy. He says, but I could understand. I knew how to talk. I knew what people were saying. He says that I used to encourage people to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to cut the ties of relationship. The Prophet said, what you did was terrible. He said, I made toba. The Prophet said, which Prophet did you make toba with? He said, I made toba with Nuh, alayhi salam. Remember, Rasulullah is higher than all of the Prophet. I made Toba with Nuh. He says, actually, I was with Nuh in the ark. He says that when Nuh, finally the people had done so much nonsense, and Nuh prayed that Allah destroy them, he said, I criticized Nuh. I said. And he said, Nuh cried so much for the destruction of his people that I also started crying. He says, after Nuh, I was with Ibrahim. He says that I was there when they cast him in the fire and they turned the fire, Allah turned the fire cool and safe for Ibrahim. After that, he says, I was with Yusuf. I was with him when he was cast in the well. I was with Musa. He says that I was at the time of Musa, and Musa taught me part of the Torah. He said, <clears throat> Musa told me, Nabi Musa told me, he says that when you meet Isa, pass him my salams. He says, I met Nabi Isa, I passed the salams from Musa, and Nabi Isa passed salams to you, to Rasulullah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. He said, Nabi Isa also taught me part of the Injil. At this stage, Rasulullah responds. He says, 
wa ala isa ruh allah wa kalimatih wa jami'i anbiya allah wa rasulihi ma damat as samawati wal ard as salam salam on isa salam on all of the anbiya all of the rusul he says as long as the heavens and earth are established and exist he said salams also on you ham because you pass salams to me the prophet said ask me for something Remember all the companions now sitting watching this. He says, ask me for something. Before Ham asks for anything, he makes a dua. He says that I want Allah to preserve you for your ummah. I pray that your ummah has tawfiq of istiqamah when it comes to your wasi. This is what he says. فَإِنَّ الْأُمَّمَ salifa. The previous nations, إِنَّمَا هَلَكَتْ بِعِسْيَانِ الْأَوْسِيَا The test for the previous nations was the wasi. When that new wali would come into authority, the ummah wouldn't be able to do their responsibility, they would fail and they would be destroyed. He says, my haja is this. He says, I would like you to teach me a few surahs of the Qur'an so I can make salah. Rasulullah says that Ali teach him a few surahs of the Qur'an. Ham said, who is this who you have entrusted me with? The Prophet asks, he says, who was the wasih of Adam? He says, his son Shay. Who was the wasih of Nuh? Who was the wasih of Hud? Who was the wasih? Keeps going, keeps going. Isa. He keeps naming them. After that, he said, in the previous books, what was the name of the wasih of Muhammad? He said, Ilya. Points, the Prophet points to Ali. He says, this is Ilya, Ali, the wasih of Muhammad. Ham, the jinn, said, does he have another name? He says, yes, his name is Haida. He said, why do you ask? He says, because in the Injil, in the Torah, his name was Ilya. In the Injil, his name was Haidara. Slightly, pronounced slightly different. The Prophet. After that, the Amir al-Mu'mineen taught him a few verses of the Quran. The story doesn't end there. After that, he's teaching him a few verses of the Qur'an. He tells Imam Ali that I will, I will suffice with these stories. He says, Wasi of Muhammad, he calls him. Wasi of, he says that I want to suffice with these stories, these uh, stories from the Qur'an. Imam Ali agrees. He says, yes, even a little bit of Qur'an is much. Then Ham stands up and he refers to, he says his farewells to the Prophet and he goes. So all of this, the Prophet teaching us a very important, that transfer of power, wilaya of the wali. Now, for us, brothers and sisters, when it comes to our responsibility, right, we're able to see, alhamdulillah, now in this day and age, we're able to see a couple of the things that people at that stage, at least we're able to get closer to what it was. There's no comparison between Rasulullah and anyone ever in history. But if you and I, those of us who are old enough to remember the death of Imam Khomeini, then, or maybe those of us who've seen the footage, you see the, the nervousness, the concern after the death, the, how the people, the emotional reaction. And then after that, the success of the resistance to be able to follow that wali. One of the reasons that we can confidently say that the supporters of Imam Khomeini and the followers of the wali are better than the mu'mineen at the time of Rasulullah or even the ashab of Ahimma is that they never allowed Imam Khomeini to become shaheed. With all of the others, we would see that the Imam, the best of creation, the believers would fail to protect him. Now for 40 years, They've given shahada, they fought, they've been sanctioned, but they've stood with the wali. They would not allow that the wali become shaheed. 
Now, for us, brothers and sisters, that test that Allah would do, it was never about how competent the wali was. That was never a question. That is he competent? Is he qualified? No, the Prophet would introduce him. The people would recognize that this person is 100% most confident, most qualified. Ibn Abbas tells us, he tells us that people would see Ali and just interacting with Ali, they used to say this, Whoever would see Ali would say this, Subhanallah ma a'lam hadha al-fata. How knowledgeable he is. Ma ashja, how, ex, how brave he is. Ma afsah, how eloquent he is. They knew that he was very qualified. It's just that test. Otherwise, when it comes to qualifications, the Prophet has said this. He says, يَفْتَخِرُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ آدَمْ بِإِبْنِهِ شَيْثِ On the day of judgment, Adam, Nabi Adam, he will take pride in his son Shaykh, his wasi after him. He says, and I will take pride in Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali is that kind of a person. That's not the test. Can I follow the wali? Can I stay on the line? Can I keep doing my responsibilities? Now, brothers and sisters, I said there was three wonderful individuals, and ideally, if we had had a chance, it would have been nice to have even three days to even, even if it was just a little bit, talk a little bit about the contributions of each one of these individuals. But we don't want to do that. We're just starting up. We'll keep it easy. We'll keep it light, inshallah. Why is it that they fought so hard against Imam Hassan? Why murder Imam al Ridha? What happens is, and this now goes to our current times, the enemies, if they had a problem with Imam Hassan or with Imam Ridha, it wasn't that they had a beef with Imam Ridha, it's because he represented the legacy and the stances of Rasulullah. Very important for us when we get a little further to what our responsibility is. Once, Muawiyah, there's a man, the person who's telling this story, he's the son of one of the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt. His says, his father's name is, I'll just make sure that I have his father's name properly here. Mughira. Mughira. Mughira is part of the inner circle of Muawiyah. The closest. He says, once my father came in an evening, and my father, I could tell on his face that he's very upset. I said, what happened? I don't see you normally at this time. I don't see you upset. Normally they would go, and they would have sessions with Muawiyah, Mughira, this guy. Sessions, they'd sit, they talk. He says this, جِئْتُ مِنْ عِنْدِ أَكْفَرِ النَّاسِ وَأَخْبَثِهِمْ I've come to you from the worst kafir, the most khabith person who's ever existed. What happened? He starts telling the story. He says that we're speaking, and I'm talking now to Muawiyah. This is after Muawiyah is now established. He has authority. He has control. He says, I suggested, the conversation went this way, that it suggested that now, perhaps at this time, we could maybe show a little Mercy to the Prophet's family. It would remain for us. It's good. You're established. You've won. They're not a threat anymore. Then Muawiyah says something that's very telling. Muawiyah explains. He, when he gets to the, the conversation continues. He mentions the name. When he comes to the discussion about the Prophet, very inappropriate words Muawiyah says. Then he says something else that I wanted to focus on. From Muawiyah's words, we learned that the struggle was not about Imam Hassan or Imam Ali before him. He said this, for me, I'm translating his, for me, it's not over until I bury the name of Rasulullah. The name of the Prophet has to be gone. So the, the, the hatred is for Rasulullah. Current responsibilities something that the enemies of Islam have discovered, and you and I, we keep seeing this happen, is that in order to stop the spread of Islam, 
one of the things that they have to do is to denigrate and distort and defame the prophet. Brothers and sisters, we talked about the idea of a person not being impressed with their own heroes. We talked about that before when we talked about Imam Hassan, Imam Sajjad. What if I destroy your heroes to the extent, defame them such you can't mention their names with pride? You see what happens is the enemies of Islam over here in the West, this has been going on a long time, from the Middle Ages. They knew that if people know Rasulullah to the extent you know him, even less than that, it's guaranteed people will be attracted to Islam. Guaranteed. So one of the things that they have to do now, why is it that they keep bringing up the issue of the cartoons? Charlie Hebdo. Why? There's some, some reason to go over and denigrate, attack, insult the Prophet of Allah. They have to make sure that the people of the world don't get to know the Prophet as he was. Our responsibility to make sure that we do know the Prophet and we introduce him, each and every one of us, we introduce him to our children. We introduce him to circles. We have circles of influence. We talk to others about Rasulullah as he was. Brothers and sisters, let me mention this also as well. It's not about saying that our prophet was like other anbiya. This part might be a little hard, but we have to buckle down and wear our big boy pants, inshallah. For us, we have to say that our prophet was better than everyone else. Better than everyone else. As Allah says in the Quran, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas. God says, you are the best nation. Not the same. Now we want to sit at the table. Not interfaith discussions. The supremacy of Islam. Once... One of the Jews came to our Prophet and he asked the Prophet, he told the Prophet, he said, are you better or Musa? Musa who had the asa, he had the stick. God, what did God do for Musa? Mentioning miracles of Musa, what the Prophet say. He says, Ya Yahudi, inna Musa, law adrakani, if Musa himself was here, he didn't believe in me. And in my nubuwa, ma nafahu imanuhu shay'a. His iman would be worthless. Wala nafa'athu nubuwa. His nubuwa would also be useless. He continued with the supremacy of Islam. He says, Ya Yahudi, wa min dhuriyati al Mahdi. One of my children. Is the Mahdi. Ida Kharaja Nazala Isa Ibn Maryam. When he comes out, the Mahdi, he comes out. Who's superior? When he comes out, when the Mahdi does khuruj, Nazala Isa, Isa will descend from the heavens, Linusratihi, in order to pray. Wasalla Khalfa. He will pray behind the Mahdi. If you see, true Islam is not apologetic, not the same as all others. This kind of reminds me of what Muhammad Ali said. He says, it's not bragging if you can back it up. So I'm not the same as everybody else. I thought of one of the stories of the Prophet for us to share, given the time, meaning a relevant fadila that we could share of our Prophet. You and I were all watching this election and we're seeing how the empire wants to get Biden in, and we see Trump struggling desperately. I mean, I'm watching the commercials just for kicks. I mean, to me, it's just, go at it. But listen to this fadila from the prophet and see how relevant this is. You heard Trump saying that there was, you know, will there be a transfer of power? Will you deny white supremacy? These things, these are, Relevant truths that people were just like, anybody, not this guy. But you and I, we can introduce ideals. It's mentioned that when our prophet died, when he was about to pass, the last days of his life, 
he would go to the masjid and he would offer prayers. And what happened, he was so ill, our Prophet, at this time, that people would have to help our Prophet to go to the mosque, to be able to offer the prayers. Absolute justice. Our Prophet, he spoke to the people. He said that, I'm going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If anyone has any right over me, anyone has any right over me, I want you to come and get that right from me. The day of judgment is too difficult. Make me halal here. And one man stood up. And he said that when you were coming back from one of the battles, you were trying to make your camel, your steed move. And accidentally, as you were trying to make the steed move, you went over and you, your, the stick accidentally, it hit me and I want qisas. The people are looking, shocked, tears. Rasulullah. The father of the ummah about to go. Qisas. But the Prophet was not joking. He said, go bring the same stick from the house. And they brought the same stick. And the Prophet lifted up his shirt for the man to hit him also on the stomach. But the people, they loved the Prophet so much. This man came over. Now he had his opportunity. And he kissed the Prophet. And the Prophet made dua for him. He said, oh Allah, forgive this man as he is forgiven. Your Prophet. May Allah raise you and all of us with Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. May He make us the true soldiers of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. May He make us those who are able to bridge that gap, who are able to follow the current wali and to introduce our Prophet to the world. We end, inshallah, with salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad.